Um, well, as said, my department is identity and access management, and it's very wide, very deep, uh, very old, and very emerging uh, at the same time. And doing that in a financial institution also involves a lot of compliance issues, regulations, laws, everything, privacy, uh, payment services directives, regulators, and so on. And so it's a very, very interesting topic. Um, uh, Martin asked me to talk specifically about attribute-based access management. And I guess most of you know the concept. Who has never heard of this? Attribute-based access management. Okay, only a few people. Um, but it's a thing that four years ago when I started at AB Numbro was not uh, so common. Most companies had role-based if they have role-based well rolled out. And um, I was giving this lecture at the Nederlandse Bank venue for the SAPSA Congress that is for uh, Sherwood uh, Architecture for Security. And that's how I ended up here today, four years later. So what I see that um, I had some slides from 2014 about connectivity. And that's one of the slides I gave. Well, it said connectivity will become more regular across identities, about types of countries, about data sets, applications, value change, continents, jurisdictions, platforms, devices, clouds, things, services, and so on. And what happens in 2017? We have what we call the API economy. And as a bank, we notice that because we have to make an API in our back door of the bank, so payment services directives um, providers like um, PayPal and Buckaroo, they must be able to operate, to initiate a payment through the back door of the bank, through an API, on their initiative in, a, in my back office. They must be able, through an API, to provide the customer with his financial data, with consent of the customer, but it's mandatory, and all banks have to provide this. Now, so that's a really clear API thing in the financial world, but we all know that it's not only in the financial world. Um, everything is connected, and it means that data protection is not really done on the application level any longer, but it's a real truth of today that the data itself needs to be protected de depending on what source it is in, who is accessing it, what type of other services from other departments or companies or jurisdictions are trying to get to the data. And then you don't get very far with the very old concept of role-based. Then you need to make real-time decisions, who is at your door, what are the attributes or context, why they are coming in, how they are coming in, and why they need your data in access to your transaction. So that's one driver why access ba uh, attribute based access management could be very important. Another slide from 2014, big data, visual data discovery, a lot of uh, job vacancies for big data analysts, data scientists, most companies getting their data or part of their business data from other companies, buying it or uh, just connecting. That's a thing which was emerging in 2014 and today it's already the truth. So the data itself has made a different uh, sort of um, transformation as well because in 2017 everybody talks about artificial intelligence. Not just data science but even building on data, doing uh, very intelligent things with it. Predictive analytics. We see that in our own fraud detection engine, which we made ourselves. It has a lot of algorithms, it sees patterns, and it knows, even if you are doing your own business on your laptop, it can recognize a pattern. If it's someone with a pistol at your head, it will know, well, this is not a regular transaction, and there will be an alert, and it will be blocked. So the financial um, fraud with identity thieves getting your credentials by phishing and then trying to do from their laptop some business transaction, they will not get there because they will commit the transaction and the payment and our fraud dodge watchdog at the background will notice that it's not you and you will be called 
hey, is this you or is this the Microsoft scam? Uh, he's, uh, even that we can recognize. So, because algorithms and um, predictive analytics, um, we can see hotspots where a crime is likely to be uh, coming, also in our security operations center. But the problem is data and data and data, you can analyze it, but the cost of analyzing is also very expensive. So the next trend that we are looking at, and we're doing that together with IBM, is um, the Watson uh, robot, you know, all the, the intelligent machine that IBM has built that can do quizzes better than any human ever could. That's a sort of learning machine and rules that will help us as well to test things. Yeah, we we uh, ask IBM to test their partner for us uh, on their machines to see, to foresee where the next crime or the next fraud is coming also uh, by pattern recognition. So it's becoming a real world. It was scientific or it was science fiction, um, let's say in 2014, but today it's really happening already. And machine learning. Well, the whole set all based on data. So data usage is not no longer just for for uh, information, but it's really uh, data driven everything today. So the data is also um, having a different function. Now, also the people, uh, the the use for the data. It's not just information, but also operations, decisions, and even future telling. That's all based on the data today. This is a picture from 2014 as well. It's India. And India had a new prime minister or pr uh, premier at that time, uh, President uh, Modi. And um, he was really a new thing in India because what he did, he dismissed 70 ministers from the government because they were fraudulent. He made a complete, complete campaign for that. And he also said we need digital cities. And he had selected 20 of them across India. Now, if you have ever been to India, you think, wow, um, that's really a big thing. They have a lot of IT people there. But if you look in the streets, you see the electricity cables everywhere and there. And uh, it's really sometimes very messy. I lived in India for one year on behalf of one of my previous banks that I worked. So this was interesting news for me. And what they do, they are building e-toilets. <laughs> OK, e-toilets. Well, this is just one example. Smart cities, I think we've all heard about the world, but India is taking this really seriously. So um, this is three years later, and they are doing uh, a lot of things to m make it possible that everyone can go to toilet. And in India, it means something. Um, we had a big fuzz in the Netherlands of someone not going to a toilet, but still doing what they need to do, and they got a big fine. And it was a female, and then there was a protest that it's not uh, so nice. But in India, 70% of the people don't have sanitary options. So in a toilet, an e-toilet in India, probably they all have an iPhone or they all have a smartphone. Uh, they have, all oh, for large, large persons, they don't have a bank. They're unbanked, but they do have a smartphone. So if you do something smart with an iPhone and a toilet, you can serve two uh, different uh, object, uh, um, options. Now, a lot of other things, this is a contact lens that can sense from your eye uh, drops whether you uh, need your insulin when you are a diabetes. This is also not so new. Then we have, of course, the drone delivery, and we have the Amazon pickup or um, order picking with robots. I've seen it in the harbor in Rotterdam as well. Ebinamro is now doing a big POC with uh, blockchain where a lot of parties are all not by default trusting each other, but they all need a big transaction. And if ocean steamer is going to the other side and it brings hundreds and thousands of containers, the containers are sooner there. That's faster to do that in 40 days than to uh, do the administrative process. So they have to wait. And in all that time, um, people are have to pay for insurance if the goods are not yet there. So blockchain... Um, and there's also a lot of automation in there. We've been to the harbor and seen all these lorries that loading these ships is also largely automized. So Internet of Things processes everything with data. Well, another driver why you need to look different at access management and protection of data. Now, also the users have changed a lot. Not all users have changed, but there used to be engineers like you or really people who know what they are doing. And now we have 
different populations, a lot of stupid users who have no idea what they're doing, don't know what's in there, just, just use their devices. Uh, they, uh, they do everything, and when we're a bank, if the customer gets a problem because they gave away all their credentials, then the thing is that we have to pay for it, not they. So that's a very expensive thing. Um, now, these are all um, digital users, and their roles have also changed. And one of the things about identity, uh, of, identity of things, or Internet of Things, is that in effect, uh, this thing is actually also becoming a user, but it's merely a, uh, an agent on behalf of a human person who is behind it or who it is servicing. So the type of identities that you need to service, uh, when we look at Payment Services Directive 2, where PayPal is behind the door and uh, needs to originate something in my back office, it's also important to know that PayPal is really PayPal. So an organization also has a user ID in a way, or an, at least an identity. Um, now here, this is what we do at IB Numbro. Um, the life cycle of um, a user or an identity has changed. It's not just Joe Molea, as we call it, joiner, mover, lever. Hey, you're an employee you're, who joins, who is moving to another department and who is leaving. And in that time you have business roles and that's it. That's old. Um, no, we have multiple life cycle status attributes. And it means that, uh, yeah, if you are a customer, for instance, you uh, have contact, you're anonymous, we don't know who you are, but you have just searched the website, and it's interesting to see whether you will onboard or not. And then onboarding itself is now not in the office, but it's digital. We have a very tedious process for that that we're now changing. Um, you have uh, to enter some data, you have a selfie with your passport, uh, you upload a lot of information and then there's a hash made across all this information. You get a code through your, uh, out of band somewhere by your SMS. Then you write that code on a white paper with a black felt tip. Then you make your selfie with that code. And then you have to do the liveliness check that you're really not a talking head, but really you're somebody. And then we can pretty, Sure, make, make sure that's you and there is background verification of your passport. And at that time, you're uh, an onboarding customer and then you get a lot of checks before you can really do something with your account. So there's also, before you are becoming a customer, you've already had three or four status to your identity. And you could say that maybe when you have onboarded digitally, not through the office, but like the regular process, that in that case, maybe you can't do the one million dollar transactions. So your authorizations could be different as well, depending on your identity life cycle status. That's just an example. Now, um, when people marry, we're still talking about customers. All right, they get maybe um, uh, uh, a, re um, a, a payment account together. They get children. There's a lot of status in your uh, literal life and when everything becomes digital that needs to be reflected in your access and authorizations and the trust we have in you and uh, the type of things you will do as a customer. So your, your relations become really not just um, one ID but really profiles that are going through a cer certain set of phases and they are all they all have, so that this could be your identity, each of those, and a lot of data is involved and metadata about that information. Uh, where does it come from? Is it validated? Data quality about the data itself is also data. So that's something we need to look at as well. Now, these are a lot of attributes that could be used to define your access manage your access. And um for employees, of course, that could be the same, depending on what department they are. They work. Are they in their own office? Are they connected through a VPN? Are they working with their own laptop, or is it the iPhone they got uh, from themselves? Bring your own uh, device. That could all be attributes deciding what you may or may not do, and um, that's what we are building at Ebinamro. Uh, we already have it, but not completely rolled out. So identity analytics is a, a way how we see that uh, the identity is used. You could do role mining in role-based. Eh? You look what are the common 
rights or authorizations that a group of people have and you say, okay, all secretaries have this, this and this, and a few have something else, right? The basic things, they all get that, that's a role and that we call role mining. For uh, identities, you could also do identity mining. And again, you look at a sort of, yeah, data analytics in effect. Um, well, I think that this is what one person could have, the type of relations or delegated authorizations one person, a natural person, could have. So an identity is no longer just an access, an account number or um, um, a user account. It's really a profile that is morphing all the time during its life. So he can be Chris Smith in the center. That's his basic identity. And then he has a relation in red. That's all the tasks he does for his boss. He could be representing his boss. He could be delegated by customers for that company. He could be delegated on behalf of his parents as a regular uh, um, um, banker, uh, bank uh, customer. He could do things for his children. He could do things for uh, uh, in another relation with his boss. So there are many, many types of act actions someone can do dealing with a binomro. And in real life, we see this because we have a lot of business lines. They each have their own customer relation background. Uh, they maintain the customer data for the, the data of people from Shell, for instance. Yeah, that's a different database than the one from the regular private customers. Traditionally, in banks, that's separated and it's not always the same. In this case, we're uh, building some identity relationship model in the middle, which is heavily based on these attributes about the relation of the identity. That's uh, the attributing attribute-based access management for customers that we use. But it's not just about identity, although that's a strong point. What I see as a trend is that identity is sort of getting loose from the access management. We always say identity and access management. Access management, of course, needs identity. But um, what I see around me is that identity is now being seen by the business as well, meaning that the people in the business lines who have nothing to do with uh, with uh, security or with IT, they think that identity and customer identity is now very important st stuff. So identity could be the last intimacy hook for customers because if these payment service providers are taking over part of the business and the fintechs are coming up and they have different bank rules than we have, so it's easier for them to be flexible and fast. They don't have all these 3,000 legacy systems. So there could be a reason why identity could be um, a thing that, that we can con still have contact with the um, customer. And it, one example is why they made Eden. They started in 2014. We've been presenting to the board that, yes, there could be a reason why identity is a thing uh, we could use in other domains as well. Eden is the bank ID. Well, there are examples in the, in, on the globe, in especially Estonia. It's not a good thing to say, but they have complete coverage. They had it four years ago ready for the government ID for, uh, and bank ID. That was the national EID, um, which is now compromised, at least uh, the card. But um, the, um, this is something that the business wants to understand, and that's really something new. I have been in this business for about since the year 2000 for three global banks. And only this year or last year, it is a thing that they want to understand, the non-IT guys in the, in the bank. So I'm happy with that. Um, so what we're doing, we have to consolidate all this identity data and sort of build a soft layer between all the back offices where the data is maintained. The delegation models need to become more clear and it's almost impossible to consolidate that. So what the best thing to do that is just make sources available, um, label the golden sources and be very aware what data is what, the data quality, the metadata about your data in a soft layer and then make it accessible from one point and then on the other end make an API, a real API, internal API to all the services in the bank that need these decisions. And that's what we're actually doing. We're building an internal API layer. We're setting up a service-oriented architecture or we already have it, but we've been building that since 2014 and it's now really 
becoming more and more live, gradually. And this attribute-based access management is now, uh, you can't, almost can't do without. Um, and this is what I call the, uh, the seven any. That could be anyone in any type of his life cycle status from any, uh, from anonymous to completely identified enrolled customer or any of their relations. It could be a machine. It could be even a process in, or a service uh, that wants to do something. There's, so it's not just human users. There's a lot of variety in between. Devices are, of course, more spread. The time zones, hey, you can uh, do your one million payments from a, bee, from a tree in Vietnam on holiday. Now, well, that's maybe a bit too much, but um, as you see, the places, the time, the networks, the apps, or the device that you come from, it's all in constant change, and there could be, the constellation could be different for every transaction that you're doing. And the seventh, because these are only six, any request. It depends what you want to do. If you want to see public data, no problem. Uh, I don't need to do your access management very strictly. But there is not just the context of who is doing uh, this and where and how, but also what do they want. And especially in banking, there is easy countable thing. You can just count how much money uh, they want to transfer. Of course, they have more activities, but uh, that's something you can express in figures. But um, with attribute-based access management, you can make a risk rating for the context where the person is doing this transaction and combine it with the transaction risk that you want to provide. If you combine that, it becomes really complex. So you see there is a lot of data involved. And, and that's why we have a very big architecture. It looks like this. Um, the blocks, the colored blocks, are uh, giving some information on uh, for instance, the blue one is authoriza all about authorizations. The green one is about the asset information. Eh? What device or what uh, stuff do you want to go to? Because this is also working for employees and people going to their internal systems. Eh? This is not just for customers. This is for both. And also, um, yeah, sessions and users and identities are also managed. Because a session is also user uh, requesting access to some server or service. So you see four layers on the left. Um, the service layer, the, the data layer, then the, uh, the layer for the processes, um, the business processes for the, and the presentation la uh, layer on the top. Um, now, this is just uh, a summary of what is being done. The real world is a lot deeper, and we also have a very complex legacy system that we need to come from. So this was a five-year project, and we're in year three now. Uh, let's see. Okay, what do you need to do attribute-based access management? Or what is attribute-based access management? It is something... Wait, let's go back. Um, it is real-time decision-making about authorizations, including the context risk and the transaction risk. So you don't have a predefined set of authorizations linked to your identity. No. Every time you come in and you want something, the risk assessment is done based on data. And of course, we're not calculating the complete set all the time. No, it's a thing that the... Um, um, a certain stuff you can pre-define, like the uh, limit, how much you can pin at the machine. That could be a very static value, so you don't need to calculate that all the time. Or it can be half products, half calculated, and you need to add one attribute. So what do you need? You need a user profile database. You need identity federation because you need a lot of identities from other areas, eh? golden sources of things and identities of uh, people from other areas. You need a trust level framework, and that's very important. A trust level framework is something that measures trust or security or no. It measures both. On the one hand, it measures the risk for the context that you are in, and it's then in the middle, we have a 10 step layers, 10 levels of risk. 
that connects the risk level of your logon contacts with the risk level of the transaction. So it means if you are on a very, very floppy uh, environment, which we think is very high risk, your authorizations can be less. If you're very secure, authorizations can be high. And flexible access management, often in many cases in the market, it means that your authentication is step up or step down. That's flexible. In this case, the authorization is also flexible. So if you can't authenticate because you don't have the right device or stuff with you, then it means that we are going to lower your authorizations instead of because we can't step up. So it's not the computer says no because I didn't bring my identifier or my whatever pass or pin or whatever. It means that, yeah, okay, you can do it, but not the same amount or a different transaction. So at both ends, it's flexible. And how is it done? It's done on rules, rule sets. And uh, those rules are stored in rule engines. And uh, actually, they are policies. They're sort of expressing the um, um, technical enforcement rules for functional rules. So if your daily limit has already been exceeded, you can't do any more transactions today. That's a rule for the transaction. If you are a secretary and you are in the office and you're working on your work laptop, you can go to your boss's file to see the latest financials, to give him information or to whatever. If you're at home, you can't. Now, it sounds like you need a lot of rules, but uh, we've done a reference visit at Nordea Bank, and IB Numbro looks at Nordea Bank as sort of their friends or as their... Now, in some areas, they are role models. In some areas, they are uh, peers. Um, so, Nordea Bank, we visited Stockholm, and uh, they have already done this, and they're running role-based and rule-based, and they're doing it with not so many rules, but a lot of attributes that constantly vary. So, the variables are not the rules, they're simple, but the, the attributes. So, again, data quality is important. Of course, when you have rules, a rule can be set up by someone who does the business um, from retail and they want to do marketing and they want to whatever and sell a lot. And then there's the legal guy and he says, no, this, this rule can't be done because there's a privacy violation. So it's very easy to make rules that are opposing each other. And how do I know that one rule is undoing another rule or they are clashing? Well, that's easy. You know, because they will look at the same attributes. They will read the same attributes value. If it's something about daily limit below zero or above zero, the daily limit attribute will be involved. So you know that these rules are touching each other and could be potentially clashing. Now, what most of the software vendors doing the XAML uh, enforcement with attribute-based access management don't have is the governance or who owns the rules. How do you decide who is able to change a rule when you have a bank with 22,000 employees with hundreds of business lines globally, different jurisdictions? If there's a central rule engine, who is deciding about this? And that's not so easy. So that's something, it's a governance topic, of course, and we designed that by ourselves. And you can easily automize it because it's a rule set about dealing with rules. Um, yeah, actually, that's expressed by this picture that uh, this needs a rule set as well. Um, then we have the, another building block, the data classifier. If you want to do data protection, what we want, on the level of the data itself, you need to know what data is important. If that's just all the same, yeah, fine-grained access management on data sets on the data layer, um, is not so easy. And we did a POC with automated data classification. I think there were 2,500 documents in the store, and we had them scanned by three or four different tools as a POC, and we looked at the results. Um, can you guess how many, what the percentage was of correct, correct classification like a human would have done? Anyone can mention a figure, a percentage? How correct could it be? 20. 20 correct? Anyone else? Half. 
80, 90, yeah. It was 95, actually. And that's quite surprising. Now, we were looking at documents, like Word documents, PDFs, and one thing that we had to define is that it's in one language only. Because if you have 20 languages, uh, they look at the semantics in the documents. It looks at the date of origination. It looks at the source of the data. A lot of data attributes that are not the data itself tell a lot about the quality and about the uh, uh, confidentiality. And once you've seen one document in this template shape of the financial report and the engine knows that this is a financial report, every next uh, thing in the same template will be uh, classified correctly as well. And most of the cases where the cl classification was not correct on confidentiality, I think we had 16 parameters, um, that was because it wasn't readable well enough, because the print was not clear or uh, uh, the scanning didn't work well. So that's promising, but still, um, I don't know how to express, but banks have a lot of data, at least, uh, that um, still a bit work to do and I think that there needs to be human intervention as well to uh, validate whether the classifier did the right job. Um, token management system, of course, if you federate and you have you all these types of access authentication, uh, that could be validated also from different parties in, uh, from different uh, federated domains, you need to know what's valid and even internally in the bank you have many types of tokens already, even for employees. Then um, the session integrator, that's uh, when you have this service-oriented architecture, a session is actually the process and it is not always persistent. Uh, it, it could not always be the same process. It could be different processes through different APIs, making a different track through your landscape and it needs to be traced. And then you have service tokens and you have a lot of complexity to make sure that this session is not um, hijacked by external services or so. So that's one of the difficult problems we had to solve. And in 2014, there was nothing on the market we could do it with. Today, these things are, as the API economy is starting, um, it's coming out that there are some solutions for it. But that's a very difficult problem when you have a service-oriented architecture and the data is, uh, and sessions are the real users. Of course, connectors and interfaces and then XML and of course, for attributes, it's very important to have the data quality, data management, and metadata. And at AB Numbra, we have a dedicated data management department. So in IT, there are six departments. The infrastructure department, yeah, they buy uh, the cloud and they manage the thing. The services department, they run thing. Then you have the development people, the solutions people. There's the CISO department, and then there's also the um, data quality management department. That's um, a department that really uh, decides about data structures, data architecture, but we also run a really large bank-wide program for data quality, and that's all about metadata. And uh, I think that's, yeah, data-driven, then you need to do this. So it's taken very seriously. And of course, the rules, uh, you need to educate the business on their ownership, they, who owns what and how does it work. I, in my experience in the past 15 years, people find it very, very difficult to understand role-based access management. So this is going to be more difficult. And well, how does it look? The pip, pop, pop, pip, pip, pop, pdp. Maybe some of you have already seen it before. Um, there's an access request. It goes to the policy enforcement point the big, the big uh, guy at the door, the gateway, then the request goes to the policy uh, decision point, which asks from the, uh, the administration point the rules and the policies, it gets the attributes from the information point, and then it comes back with a decision and the enforcement point as really enforcing the access or not. And we do that with... Um, some um, thing like um, encryption, you could st store all the data in full clear text and only, um, and then encrypt everything they can't see, or you could do the other way around, encrypt a complete data set and only decrypt according to the policy enforcement point that part of the data that can be seen. So it means that any person with attribute-based access management can see only the data they can see in this context, in this role, at this moment, with this device, and they can only see this part of the data 
really on the field le level, even part of the data field, uh, that's decided on the very moment they do the request. Take some time, eh? there's decryption. But uh, th yeah, this is now quite common. Now, what are the features? Context aware, rule based, fine grained access decisions, real time, step up authentication when your context is not safe enough, step down authorization if you can't change anything. It's far more flexible than role based because it's real time. And I think that the hybrid solution is the best, but roles are, all, are very handy and they're very good. But they can't do this fine-grained stuff, so you could add some attribute based with it. So the rules are in your access management system. You don't need to configure every rule for access on data level in your application, but you do it. You enforce it with the access tooling. And that makes it very easy to change rules. Eh? If you have a trust level framework, like we have, um, if your iPhone is hacked and the iOS is compromised globally, for instance, you could, I can in my tool set, just bring down the uh, trust level for all iPhones of this type of make or um, iOS. I could push a message to the user and I could bring down the authorization level because the trust level is going down for that device. So it's also a maintenance question because that doesn't remain. Eh? Risk never remains the same next minute, it's different. And, but it's very easy because just by changing the risk settings or the rule uh, trust level settings, um, I can change the access enforcement. Um, okay, well, uh, the data set or the transaction or whatever you want to do has a trust level as well. And um, that happens with the context as well. And um, you can Im immediately change your iPhone when you're... You know. uh, the implementation is the best way of doing it. That's why how we do it. Evolve from role-based to attribute-based because, surprise, a role is also a rule. Uh, and you can express any role in the semantics as a rule. Or even you can make it an attribute, eh, the role number. And then um, I think that that's a hybrid situation because fully attribute based, yeah, if you have legacy, you have to roll out for a complete bank. It's almost impossible. And I think governance and business involvement is the most crucial thing to look at. Educating the users when you're talking in a company. Uh. So this is the summary. Um, digitization, data is used for not just information, but also for operations, decisions, uh, automated decisions, a lot of connectivity, de-parameterization, not just the big fortress. Well, a lot of types of uh, platforms, a lot of clouds, almost every big multinational has more than one cloud, and a lot of clouds they don't know. <laughs> uh, Real-time data retrieval from different sources, uh, not your own store, but through APIs. APIs, contacts with users, times, devices, microservices, automated decision-making, artificial intelligence, and that's the context. And this is what we do in identity and access management to uh, sort of support this. Now you can read for yourself. More flexible, data-driven decisions. Now this is about my last slide, I think. Time for questions. Yeah. So in this situation, if I have a problem somewhere, like I said, when I'm in America, and I have to access, access to talk to the call center to make it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, then uh, in, in IBM Number Bank, if we block your credit card, you will be contacted. You won't be just blocked. Uh, there, and there also, it, it, this is the 
engine that enables all this. Eh? It's not the decision how uh, the process will be when they block your credit card. That's up to the business. But I can assure you, we have, um, I don't brought this slide here, but we have, um, the access management is uh, intelligent or uh, rule-based, but behind the access door, there is the fraud engine with its algorithms and its rules, which is already working. We had a patent for that in the US uh, since four years. And they, are, they look at the black side of things to block you, for instance, for your credit card. The IAM engine looks at the white side of things to make sure that you're doing whatever you can. And they are working together. So, and that's a sort of gray area in the middle. And for credit cards, indeed, there will be a red flag if you're in a situation where something is not according to the fraud detection, uh, and they will contact you. But it's the business who decides. Uh, this is just the engine that enables it. So if this would happen, and this would be coming known to someone in the business, or the guy who decides on these rules, that's why the governance on the rules should be very clear, then they should change the rules either in the fraud engine or in the IAM engine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, actually, what the another thing that's looking at it, before you implement a role, a rule, you need to test it. That's one of the difficult things. You set rules, you play the rules with the attributes, and you know now this and this and this will be the outcome. But when you think, okay, then you have to change the rules. And the most difficult thing in this rule-based is, um, what rules do I need with what attributes to get this and this and this outcome? So reverse engineer the decision that you want. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. You can talk for hours on that. Yeah. Yeah, they will push. Yeah. Now, 90% um, of the business is done through the mobile phone, and then the business decides on how they communicate. It's their customer. Eh? We're just under the surface. But um, they also ask the same question. But they can push buttons or they can push um, messages to the customer to explain why it works. And uh, what we see from all this from the fraud detection, and we know the patterns of behavior of customers. Um, most patterns are very, very um, consistent. So there may be diversity in what they do, but most customers are pretty consistent in their behavior. So if they have once learned that this is working like this, and oh, maybe I can do step up. And I have built a, a POC, a sort of mock-up demo when we started this, where, yeah, I didn't bring it in because it's too much time maybe, but Really, you can see, select your logon method, and then you can just uh, present the customer with choices. That's, yeah, all about a good user interface. Yeah, but it's, it's still your same app on your phone, and you have your own uh, settings there, so, yeah. <laughs> But it's all about design of the interface. I, I agree with that. If that's not well done, then these problems may occur. So I need to educate the business also in this. Um, PII data as defined by GDPR in different uh, variations, uh, there are two sides to it. One side is that security uses data about your context and about you, which it has always done. Um, biometric data, for instance, for authentication. 
um, we're not storing that and we're hashing it and then uh, making sure we're not ever making it available or storing it on the iPhone or sending it across or whatever. That's one side. On the other side, a data classification to know what sources, what uh, areas contain PII um, is very important. So th uh, this is, I think that privacy, being privacy compliant in the usage or uh, whether agreements with the owners or the data processor is part of your data quality. So you need to ring fence the systems and the areas inside your company that contain PII. And that's how we do it, through this data quality department. Thank you. You're welcome.